Okay, so we were um, looking <clears throat> back at the book No God Sedek to sort of um, look slightly deeper at the letters that were originally written um, on behalf of the uh, reform synagogue that was built in Hamburg. Um, because again, I, I think that seeing the back and forth um, between uh, Rabbi Breslau and Hamburg Besden, it, it sort of recasts things a little bit for me. So I want to go back and see the original letters that were written by Orthodox rabbis, but that are they're writing pro-reform um, and see, you know, are they, are they, are they similar to what Rabbi Breslau says or not? And they're, 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 they're slightly different. Um, one thing I did notice is that the three rabbis that are written to, Rabbi uh, Rikinati, um, Rabbi Horan, and Rabbi Kunitz, they seem to be answering different questions. For instance, they ask, I think the most, I mean, believe it or not, we would think the organ is probably the most controversial question, but I don't think it is for them. I think the most controversial question for them is changing the prayer from Hebrew to German. Um, I think the organ part, especially because it's not clear they want it on Shabbos. Um, I, I mean, I think they do want it on Shabbos because they only meet on Shabbos, but um, because there was some precedent for that, especially in the Shulchan Aruch, and it's true there's precedent for prayer in, in another language, but organized prayer on the level of a whole synagogue seems like a much bigger break, I think, for them than the organ. And so it's interesting. They don't ask the question, I mean, we don't have their letter to these rabbis, but Rabbi Rikinani, Rabbi uh, Kunitz, who are the, the more traditional rabbis, Rabbi Horn is less traditional from what I can understand, more tendency toward being a reformer. He writes a much longer letter. Um, they ask him, he, he addresses the question of prayer in German, but Rabbi Kunitz and Rabbi, and Rabbi Rukhnadi don't. And I'm assuming that, and, and I, I saw somebody wrote this, that there's a possibility that they only picked and chose who to ask what questions to, uh, which makes you know total sense. Um, I wanted to look closer in, I want to sort of zoom in on the question of prayer, because we haven't really talked about this. Uh, leaving, one of the things they wanted to do is, uh, <coughs> is they want to leave out the, uh, they want to leave out the silent Amidah. They want to only have the public recitation of the Amidah. Now, why is that? Um, I don't know what it's like in church. Uh, but I'm guessing there's no, there's not a lot of silent prayer. Um, you know, I'm guessing it's, um, it's either said by the priest or it's chanted altogether. Uh, and I'm guessing that's why they don't want to do it. Something doesn't seem to them dignified enough to have silent prayer, especially probably with people shuckling. And so um, it just doesn't feel formal enough to them. And so they ask, about getting rid of the silent prayer. That's what they wanted to do. That's what they were doing in, in, the, um, in, in the first temple in Hamburg. It's funny because I would guess that reform Jews today probably like the silent prayer. Silent prayer feels more prayerful to us actually. Uh, I mean, I don't, I don't know. But, um, but obviously in a more formal German church-like system, it's gonna be more out loud. So this is Rabbi, uh, he's I think the most, He's the, he's Rabbi Riccanati is from from Italy, is more traditional, but I don't think he really gets reform. Rabbi Kunitz is more traditional, but he has been accused of being a reformer at times, and I think he's more on the borderline. I think Rabbi Horn is much more is sort of over the edge more toward reform. But this is Rabbi Kunitz, and um, and he writes uh, about tefillah balachash prayer silently. Mishpat Katuv Hadarhu. Uh, he's quoting here a verse, but um, it's, it's written as a law and it's a beautiful thing. I think what he's saying is we should appreciate silent prayer. And then the, he quotes the Gemara in Sotan. And we read this once. Um, why did the rabbis say you should pray silently? Now, why, um, you know, does God see this positive thing? Be'arnu heitev, Sefer ben Yochai. So he quotes a book that he wrote. He wrote another book on the question of who wrote uh, the Zohar. 
but um, the Afghan Shabakal Amba Am Timsa Tfil Lachash Pratit. And then he says, and also among every nation, we find that they have individual silent prayer. The Ain Zarotba, and it's not going to make us feel like foreigners. The Havdil Yisrael, Miben Amim, the Ain Koroa. And having silent prayer is not going to make the Jewish people look like foreigners or strangers um, in the eyes of other nations. So that's interesting, right? Now that he, on the one hand, he's very traditional. He's saying to them, keep the silent prayer. But his justification is, don't worry. You know, it doesn't look too different than the church. It's kind of funny. Uh, uh, you know, is that true that everybody has silent prayer? I guess so. But when do people have silent prayer? When do Christians have silent prayer? I assume it's on their own, probably not in church. Ubefrat, so, so it wouldn't be much of an argument. It, you know, it's, if what he means is, you know, Christians pray at home on their own silently, so that doesn't really, that's not an argument for keeping the silent prayer in the, in the Shulon Hamburg. The um, so maybe what he's saying is that their silent prayer isn't so strange. In other words, he's trying to it sounds like he's trying to get them to retain the silent prayer by arguing that it doesn't make you that different than others. But Pratlafi Tama Gamara Hanal, and then he says, that, and especially because of the the reason that the Gamara gives for having silent prayer, which is so that people can't hear each other. Lo Yishma Ishet Reyehu Bit Vadot Chetav that one can't hear another when they confess their sins. He blocked the Sod Netzach. And the, the Vidoy, confession, even through, this is strange, Admat Kohanim, I think through the, through the, through the, the priests, among the nations. So I think what he's referring so what he's referring to here is, is Catholic is 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 Catholic confession. Right? He's saying Catholics confess, and uh, the Talmud says we should say the Sound Amida because we're gonna confess in it. So um, he he blocked the Sod Netzach. It's a great, you know, it's an eternal secret, and it's blocked. This is a Yiddish word which I assume means it's set, set out, like a blot gemara. Um, so he's saying, you know, I think what he's arguing to them is silent prayer, you know, doesn't make us very different than the Christians. And the purpose for silent prayer, the gemara says, is in order that you can confess your sins. And that certainly doesn't make us different than, than the Christians. Uh, I think that's what he's trying to say to them. Now, he's, so he's using sort of very creative modern arguments or very creative kind of reformist arguments to argue for traditionalism, uh, you know, because they want to get rid of the silent Amidah. So that's interesting. Uh, now there's, uh, I found two articles by Rabbi that mention our Moshe It's one article I sent you yesterday by Pelly, Moshe Pelly about uh, early reform methodology. And he, he mentions something about, about this. He says, the last point is clearly evident in their writings. There is no attempt to conceal the fact that Hebrew reformers that to a lesser degree than the German Jewish counterparts, set the Gentile religious practices as an example for the ideal way of worship. This tendency was manifest in two ways. The direct approach to these clinics, arguing that silent prayer exists in every nation in the form of private prayer. Clinitz maintains that the silent prayer among Jews too should be in private and not in public, thus supporting the reform to eliminate sound Shemana Esrei. So Pele, I think, is wrong here. What he says is, he says that in that paragraph, Rabbi Kunitz is arguing uh, pro-reform, that he's saying, I agree with you, get rid of the silent Amidah. And, and what is his argument to get rid of the silent Amidah? According to Pelly, it's that other nations pray silently. So Jews too, um, that other nations, other peoples pray silently, but they pray in private silently at home and not in the church. The church is loud prayer. And so according to Pelly, what, what, what um, Rabbi Kunitz is writing there is an argument pro-reform to get rid of the silent Amidah and to relegate silent Amidah just to the home. 
Then he says, overtly and without hesitation, Clintus declares, thus to the observer, there's no strange about it, silent prayer, to differentiate between Israel and the nations. He even supports his contention by an analogy with the Catholic confession, which is also conducted in private and in secret. So I don't, I don't think he's right. In other words, he's, he's assuming from that paragraph that Rabbi uh, Kunitz is arguing, is agreeing with the reform. But if he agrees with them, so why, it doesn't, doesn't make sense to me. It doesn't seem to fit, um, right? He had said, um, That, um, that, you know, number one, everybody does it. And number two, it's like confession that it should be done silently. So I think he's arguing for silent prayer. And it's, if, if he's, I don't think he has to argue for silent prayer at home. That's not what's at stake. What's at stake here is silent prayer in the synagogue. So I, I don't get from this paragraph that he's saying, yeah, get rid of the silent prayer, let them do it at home. I get from this paragraph that he's saying, retain the silent prayer because it's important. Uh, it's similar, you know, and, and other people pray silently at times and it's similar to confession. Pelly is arguing that no, uh, Rabbi Kunitz is saying, um, saying, I agree with you, get rid of the silent Abidah. It's, it's not what it seems like to me. It, there's one other article I just wanna, mention this article i can't remember who wrote this it, it, it looks like it was like a college paper a phd a very short phd paper something it's about rabbi moshe kunitz and um and he writes here um he writes a little bit about his life he writes here a little bit about nogat sedek um and he says rabbi moshe kunitz answer is not clear on the question if a chazan may skip the amidah and to be recited and just recited out loud with no need for the congregation to individually recite that prayer. Notwithstanding the latter being in fact the universal practice of all the Jews. Rabbi Moshe Kunitz's position on this is not evident from the text. While it is clear that he does not forbid it, um, he also does not encourage it. So he's got a note here from a different book, The History of the Jews in Transylvania which states that Moshe Kunitz allows the central prayer to be skipped by the congregation. Which states, um, and, and it quotes, there's an article in Asufot, I'll have to find that. Which states that Moshe Samet, Moshe Samet is a modern uh, historian. He wrote a book on early reform. Understood from Rabbi Moshe Kunitz, that Rabbi Moshe Kunitz held that the prayer should be said by the congregation silently. Right? This is the other side of the argument. I, and I agree with this. I think this is what it says. Moshe Samet also had the rabbi. Moshe Kunitz was not asked if the prayer could be in German because he would probably disagree with the reform position on this and forbid it. He calls him a Torah scholar maskil. After rereading Rabbi Moshe Kunitz's writing in Nogat said it multiple times, I'm unable to come to a conclusion. Moshe Samet is probably right that he's both, right? That he's a Torah scholar maskil. He's both. He's not a reformer. He's a Torah scholar and a traditional Torah scholar, but who's also enlightened. Now, um, I, I mentioned in the class on Kidney Oat that uh, Mark Shapiro has a long note in which he argues actually step different than this. He argues that Rabbi Moshe Kunitz was not a reformer at all, and maybe not even a Moscow. I mean, obviously he's open-minded, but that he's a traditionalist in all ways. And, and I'll show you that note. But, but um, I, I was really confused because when I read that paragraph, I assumed it meant um, you know, that, that he, was, he was basically going against the reform, what the reform wanted, and he was saying, retain the silent Amidah. But then I saw Pelly's thing, and I was like, that doesn't seem right at all. And so I was really happy to see, um, to see this uh, note uh, by whoever the author is, I can't remember, um, who I think agrees with me that, uh, that, or he's saying basically that it's not clear. It's not clear from the text. I think it is clear. I think that, um, that, uh, I I'll read it one more time for you. But feel a balach, I should tell me what you think. But I think it's clear that he's he's disagreeing with the reform position that he wants to retain the sound amida. But in the show, but feel a balachash prayer silently. Mishpat katuv hadarhu. It is written mishpat katuv. Right? It's a law that is written. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, somebody made a point that um, confession is out loud, but it's just in a 
you know, with a priest. So mishpat katuv hadarhu. That, mean, that means it, it's a it's a it's a cloak. It's a phrase from Tanakh, but what it means is mishpat katuv. It's a law that's written and hadarhu. It is beautiful. So what does he mean by that? The answer is he means don't get rid of it. Why did they fix tefillah in the Amidah silently? Uh, so I've explained, uh, he says I explained it in a different place. And he says everybody prays silently at times. And it doesn't mean there's nothing strange about it to separate the Jews from other nations in the eyes, in the eyes of all who see. It's clear to me that he's talking about silent prayer in the synagogue. And if it's only, if what he's saying is like Kelly said, that it's silent prayer at home. So what's, so what's the, you know, this is a law and it's beautiful. And in the eyes of all who see it, it's nice. It, it's normal. I think that means it's public. The proud, the fitam, and then, he, and then he's adding, you know, the reason that it's silent is because it's, it's a kind of confession. And they have the idea of confession. You know, if you said to the non-Jew, Andrew thinks, you know, it's weird that you're praying silently. First of all, he says it's not weird because everybody pray. They understand, people understand the idea of silent prayer. And if he said to them, it's because we're confessing our sins to God, uh, you know, they, they would understand that. That's a very deep idea. So it's clear to me that, that that's what he's saying, um, that, it's, uh, that he's arguing against the reform that I think he wants to. And um, now this also, how you understand this paragraph, right, might depend on how you understand who he is. Uh, and it could be that Pelley understands Caesar Rabbi Kunitz as somebody who's more reformer than we would like to think. Um, I'll just show you quickly the notes from Mark Shapiro. Um, it's in an essay on the question of who wrote the Zohar. And uh, so he quotes Rabbi Kunitz's book. Rabbi Kunitz wrote a whole book on the question of who wrote the Zohar. Um, and then uh, maybe we'll read this next time. This note uh, basically is a whole, it's a long note, a um, uh, footnote in this article that, um, here's the article. It was written in uh, Yeshiva Chobbe Torah's journal. Uh, of Torah called, uh, what the journal is called. You have to believe that the Zohar was written by Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. So he, he quotes our quotes a lot because our quotes wrote a whole book about it called Bar Yochai. Um, and uh, I just cut and pasted his notes here uh, The uh, about Rabbi Kunitz. But maybe tomorrow I'll just take a quick look at that. I'll take a look at that note because um, he basically argues uh, against others. You know, the, the, really, the jury sort of out about Rabbi Kunitz and, and what, you know, is he, is he, you know, what, where on the spectrum is he? Is he, you know, fully sort of, you know, they used to do this about Rabbi Soloveitchik too. Is he a traditional Rosh Yeshiva? Is he, you know, basically a philosopher who, who was also a Rosh Yeshiva? Or he's somewhere in the middle, he's a mixture, you know, it's confusing and that's so. Um, depends who you are. Everybody sees Rabbi Salvatore differently. You know, some people will say, "No, he's a traditional Rosh Hashiv, and the things he wrote about philosophy was just, you know, to to to, to make orthodoxy more honored, you know, in the world." Uh, other people will say, "No, that's that's you know, that's not true at all. He was a modernist, and uh, you know, it's all it's all kind of in the eyes of the of the beholder sometimes with certain people who are complex." Okay, so maybe tomorrow we'll just do that note. I think it's a very interesting uh, note. And, and the difference between these three, what I'm noticing in No God Said it, is the difference between these three rabbis is vast. You know, that, I mean, not vast, but the difference between the three rabbis is a lot that you, you can see from what they write back to the Hamburg Besden, how long their letter is and what they write back. Number one, what they've been asked, and number two, where they're coming from. Um, they're not all, they're not all covered. All right, I'll be back.